to follow American clock in time, but maybe Egyptian. Yalla, <laughs> imshi. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll move on. Um, and uh, we are really delighted <coughs> that uh, the uh, ambassador uh, is able to uh, join us, especially at uh, this stage of developments uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. Um, it can be very confusing. Um, as I mentioned to the ambassador, as a uh, younger uh, academic observer and uh, subsequently also participant, but I um, uh, actually followed the uh, American US policy uh, for the, under the presidency, uh, presidency of um, some 13 ambassadors uh, and presidents going all the way back from Truman now to Trump. And uh, it wasn't easy. But uh, now it seems to me that it <coughs> becomes perhaps uh, even more complicated. Uh, that's why we need some clarity. And um, the ambassador was gracious to come I, I will um, briefly introduce him and make two footnotes, and then we'll move on. <clears throat> As you know from the information we distributed that Ambassador Yasser Vedva, who is uh, currently the Egyptian ambassador to the U.S., uh, actually has a very long and rich uh, career in uh, diplomatic activities, uh, I think, over 33 uh, years. And um, uh, he served in very senior posts, uh, such as uh, Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Chief of the Minister Cabinet as well. And uh, diplomatically, uh, also, uh, he served abroad, for example, the ambassador to Israel from um, September 2008 to August 2012, and he was also Deputy Chief of Mission at Egypt's uh, Embassy in Berlin, Germany as well, and also he served at the Egyptian embassies in Italy, Iraq, Cyprus, and China. So um, obviously, <coughs> he brings uh, a wide range of experience and uh, we would be grateful, of course, if we can share some of those um, today. Uh, unfortunately, some of my colleagues uh, who are planning to come are delayed for some uh, reason, but I would like to uh, mention that uh, this particular seminar is co-sponsored by our colleagues, of course, uh, Professor Don Wallace, right here, the chairman of the International Law uh, Institute. Uh, we are collaborating on many of these issues also for uh, many uh, decades. Uh, the uh, University of Virginia School of Law, their Center of National Security Law, uh, as well as the Potomac uh, Institute uh, and the International Center for Terrorism uh, Studies. So um, we are basically ready to go. We are delighted that we do have with us um, very distinguished uh, diplomats um, and academics who are interested in this particular uh, area, and they will participate in the Q&A uh, discussion. Um, before the ambassador speaks, I, I have a um, uh, obligation to mention one area which uh, really deserves always uh, attention, and this is to express condolences um, not only to the latest uh, uh, brutal massacre uh, in November of worshippers uh, in Sinai Mosque, but uh, also to the uh, many uh, sacrifices that uh, Egypt has uh, made um, for many uh, years uh, as a frontline 
of uh, the regional and global war of terror. As we know, in fact, in October, uh, as you know, October the 6th, we marked the anniversary of the assassination of President Anwar Sadat. Again, was sacrificed himself on the altar, if you may um, describe it as an altar of, of peace. And thank God that uh, the peace continues uh, now. But uh, Egypt uh, continued to, to pay a very dear price, and there are those who believe that Egypt um, pays the price on behalf of many, many other nations. So number one, uh, we have to recognize the sacrifices and express the sympathies. And secondly, I believe we, when I say we, the international community, we must acknowledge the very uh, special uh, contributions that uh, Egypt is uh, paying, contributing to regional global security uh, concerns, uh, whether it is uh, the peace processes or the relations uh, with other nations uh, in the region um, and uh, elsewhere. So this acknowledgement uh, must uh, be uh, repeated again and again um, because we deal with uh, human uh, life and many times it's misunderstood. Obviously, um, we have to similarly express condolences to uh, the United States for their sacrifices. And um, our chairman of the board of Virgin General Al Gray, who was the commandant of the Marine uh, Corps, um, he uh, has a, a special, I, I think, uh, feeling about the sacrifices uh, in Beirut when uh, 251 members of the Marines uh, were killed, as you may recall, the suicide bombing in 1983. And at the same time, so over 50, I think, uh, French commandos uh, as well uh, were as a peace force uh, in the region. So we, we have to remember the, the people who died and uh, we, we have to acknowledge also the support <coughs> of um, the countries who led the, the fight against uh, terrorists uh, at home and abroad. So um, again, with this uh, really spirit, I would like to uh, welcome the ambassador. We're looking forward to his remarks. We'll try to develop uh, a discussion and bring it to the attention of a wider audience uh, in the United States and internationally. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alexander. Thank you very much. Uh, the single guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, before I will start, I would like just uh, first of all to introduce uh, my uh, dream team, which is they came with me to, uh, today. Uh, first of all, uh, that's uh, my uh, DCM, uh, Wael Hamid, that's uh, Minister Plenipotentiary uh, Ayman Dessoui, and the Councillor Barakat al uh, They came uh, with me really also uh, to be part of, you know, that's our discussion. It's not only just uh, to come uh, for, you know, to take notes or whatsoever, or to give me a support or a solidarity, but uh, actually because uh, we are working, you know, that's in the embassy in, uh, in a spirit of, you know, that's we are uh, a team. Uh, and this is very important uh, while we are trying to reflect and uh, we're trying to spread, you know, our uh, message. It's not only as an ambassador, but as a team of the embassy. And for this reason, we, we came as a team today. And for this reason, really, I introduced my, uh, my team and asked them to, uh, to come with me also to be a part for, uh, to enter, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, to be interactive, you know, with the people when we have also that discussion. Uh, let's me first, you know, that uh, maybe I will uh, have, you know, that uh, some uh, remarks. Uh, frankly speaking, I intentionally, I, I, I make it, you know, very short because 
I always believe, you know, that's in uh, Q&A, more than we have just only to be listening to a very boring, uh, sometimes, you know, remarks. Maybe uh, mostly you are, you are, you're fully aware what I'm going to say. But the Q&A, it's more, you know, that's, uh, you know, vivid and more, you know, that's lively and uh, it gives you maybe more a broader uh, perspective what's exactly what we are facing, what uh, was the topic, you know, you'd like, you know, that uh, you would like to raise it and you'll, for sure you, you will have a, a definite answer from my side or from our side, if you can say the same. That's a uh, distinction, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to join you today. I offer sincere thanks to the Botanic Institute, not only for the inviting me here, but more importantly for focusing attention on the critical topic of relation be relations between our two countries. The Egypt-United States partnership is not only a priority for both nations, but also integral of inter international stability and security. I can confidently say our relationship has never been more crucial to the Middle East region nor has it ever been stronger. In, in a word, the Egypt-U.S. relationship today is, is, is resolute, grounded in a common commitment in a, uh, to peace with Israel through the Camp David Accords nearly 40 years ago. <coughs> it has endured and grown for decades since and will continue to do so. The partnership extends far beyond the cooperation between our security establishments. It's a meaningful functioning strategic alliance on a range of issues, one that involves the highest level of both governments, but also commercial relations in a private sector and the affinity between our two peoples. During his historic visit to Washington in April, President El Sisi reaffirmed with President Trump their joint commitment to this partnership. They pledged to work with uh, regional allies to compact terrorism and restore stability in the Middle East. We have seen that commitment demonstrated in the months since then as our countries continue to collaborate on a wide range of mutual interests. This collaboration is vital because it forged a unity of purpose that terrorism seeks to disrupt. As you know, a terrible attack took place less than two weeks ago in North Sinai, where terrorists killed over 300 Egyptians while they were at a prayer, an, an unspeakable act of violence and terrorism. This attack shook Egypt its, to its core. But as President Sisi said in the days following, it is first and foremost strengthened our resolve to fight and to completely defeat the threat of terrorism. We cannot do so alone on the international level, nor should we, since maintaining stability and the security in Egypt is essential to the long-term security and the stability in, of the entire region. We know this, and our American partners know this as well. Indeed, the United States has been an in indispensable uh, friend to Egypt as, uh, as we strengthen our nation against the threat of terror. The recent military exercise between our nations, known as Operation Bright Star, focused on enhancing counterinsurgency capabilities and, sorry, uh, counterinsurgency capabilities that are needed for, uh, fight the, for this fight. As a member of a global coalition of counter ISIL, Egypt also works closely with the United States to provide intelligence and eliminate sources of terrorist funding and recruitment. And for decades, we have ensured that U.S. forces are granted preferred access through Egyptian airspace and Suez Canal. Our ability to finance and uh, acquire U.S. defense equipment is a key element of our national security strategy. And then uh, 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 complement by training of personnel and the interoperability of the weapons systems, joint planning efforts and opportunities for combined operations that advance the interests of both our nations. Ladies and gentlemen, 
And the while this uh, partnership has a, has a long legacy, its activity is going on multiple fronts. Uh, just last weekend, Defense Secretary James Mattis visited Cairo to discuss how Egypt and the United States can work together even more closely to address regional changes, especially in the wake of the Sinai tragedy. Egypt stands in a stark contrast of to the st destabilization failures of the governors consuming most of the region. Thus, across Egypt's borders with Libya, vast, uh, vast ungoverned space have led that state to the brink of collapse and created a base of operation that the terrorist group such as Islamic State. The conflict in Syria continues to foment regional uh, instability and the terrible humanitarian crisis. The common failure binding this and the other areas of turmoil is the collapse of governing institutions that ensure stability, security, and the opportunities for citizens to not only meet basic needs, but prosper. In each crisis, Egypt is working to establish peaceful settlements and consensus governments that preserve the integrity of the state and deny terrorist group of uh, gr uh, terrorist group a, foot a foothold to spread their uh, hateful and distorted version of Islam. With our president's encouragement, Egypt's religion leaders are reasserting uh, re uh, Islam's true uh, tense of peace and inclusivity. At the same time, we are pursuing profound economic reforms that will bring new jobs and the growth to Egypt. And through our re renewed parliament, the Egyptian people are reforming their own institutions to ensure that our government is responsive to the needs of its citizens. All, this, all of these efforts serve to promote stability, strengthen communities, and marginalize extremist messages. These efforts are difficult and numerous, and they will require time and the observance to be seen through uh, to completion. Egypt is not shying away from uh, this challenge. We knew that's to build a secure and a prosperous future for our citizens and to ensure the long-term stability of the Middle East region, we must meet it uh, head on as nation and share this burden with like-minded partners. Our partnership over the years with the United States has helped make much of this possible. But there is much more to be done together for the safety and the prosperity of Americans and Egyptians alike. Ladies and gentlemen, our two nations have worked together to achieve great things in the last 40 years. Today, circumstances and the crisis throughout our region call on us to do so again, not only for our own sake, but for the broader region and the world as well. I know that with a strong partnership between Egypt and the United States will remain result, result, and we are up to the challenge. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your discussion. As I said, really, it will be a very short, you know, that's uh, remarks, because uh, I wouldn't like really to take more time from, uh, from you. I leave it, you know, that's uh, for a discussion. I open you know, for a discussion. I said, really, it's not only myself, and I give even chance for my colleagues if you would like to add, you know, that's any uh, remarks uh, now or to wait, you know, for, uh, you know, the secure day. Thank you again. Thank you very kindly. Um, I, I, I think, uh, obviously, uh, the international community uh, is impressed with. Uh, the many contributions of uh, Egypt to international collaboration uh, going all the way back to 1922 when Egypt actually <coughs> became uh, independent um, and uh, the recognition with the U.S. and so forth, but particularly, as you mentioned, in the last um, 40 years from Camp David uh, on. But um, uh, again, the, uh, you, you stress the security, I think, um, cooperation 
in in terms <coughs> of the uh, dialogue that continues, as well as uh, joint, uh, let's say, exercises um, and uh, <coughs> the exchange of uh, intelligence and so forth. Um, I I think what is uh, important to understand as you try to lead us in this path that it's not only the security stability dimension but the deep relationships that includes uh, economic development uh, you spoke about some of the reforms uh, as well and the uh, social and cultural relationships uh, as I mentioned as a academic I know how important this uh, dialogue <coughs> with the Egyptian colleagues um, actually contributed however modestly to our understanding of, <coughs> of the Middle East and the Egyptian uh, legacy and so forth so I think if you can elaborate uh, a little bit on the um, link between the security and the, the cultural um, aspect and the historical aspect, what comes to mind, for example, is the very rich uh, history of uh, Egypt that is reflected in the archaeological findings uh, and the legacy to the world and uh, in that particular area of both security and culture, uh, as I understand it, there, there is an ongoing collaboration, cooperation between the United States and Egypt in terms of combating uh, uh, trafficking of antiques and archaeological um, and artifacts and so forth. So can you um, explain the, um, the, this kind of collaboration, how it contributes actually to more stability and encouraging, for example, tourism to come to Egypt and uh, see themselves, uh, their findings and so forth. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the, the question, which is very, you know, that's, uh, to answer it really, uh, it would take, you know, maybe more than an hour, but I would try, you know, that's uh, to be limited uh, myself. Uh, but it's a very important question, because I said really in the beginning, I would just uh, will say, you know, that uh, my remarks are to be very, very short, and just to be highlighting, you know, that's uh, the main issues, and uh, to give you uh, the frame uh, work of our relationship between the two countries, but doesn't mean really that it covered everything. I and I leave it to for the Q and A as I mentioned uh, before. Uh, for sure, you know that's our relationship. It's not only a security, you know that's uh, and uh, military, you know that's a relationship. It is, you know that's uh, uh, it's more than it deepen, you know that's uh, more than uh, security and you know that's uh, military. But the military relation is always said really male to male, you know, this is a backbone of the relationship between the two countries when we started and the relationship, you know, uh, 40, uh, more than 40 years ago. Uh, but doesn't mean we ignored, you know, that's the rest of the relationship. But for sure we have a lot, you know, that's uh, economically, culturally, socially. Uh, uh, it means economically I'm talking also the trade and uh, talking about, you know, that's uh, people to people, you know, that's uh, exchange. Uh, talk about uh, the educational uh, also exchange. Uh, we have a lot of uh, you know other aspects. Uh, that's it means uh, I'm not only that's uh, the relationship between the two countries not only focus on one pillar. We have a lot of pillars, and this is here our uh, prerogative here what we are working. When I said really that I have here the uh, my dream team, uh, I decided to have it because they are covered in a certain area you mentioned about. You're talking about, you know, culturally, economically, and so on, uh, about also the antiquities and the how we are, uh, you know, dealing with Ayman, you know, that's, uh, he can brief you about exactly when we sign an agreement, uh, even uh, last year, uh, concerning 
uh, you know, that's antiquity that maybe Ayman or he will brief us concerning, you know, particularly in this, uh, 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 you know, uh, in this topic exactly. But before I give, you know, Ayman a chance, but as I said, we have a lot between the two countries. Uh, still, we have also, you know, a lot of rooms. We are not reached up to, you know, that's the expectation between the two countries. We have our history, but still also it's not yet explored, it's not yet, you know, that's, uh, we can, will not be used here. Uh, that's uh, the people here still we are just talking about the history of Egypt, but we are not utilized yet, you know, that's our history, and we are not yet, uh, you know, that's uh, attract the American people to be more and more, you know, that's uh, to go to, to visit my country. They, are ha they have only, uh, you know, a perception about only my country. They are talking about, yes, the history, about pyramids, about, you know, that's uh, Luxor and so on. But frankly speaking, they don't know exactly what's Egypt. They don't know, you know, what's Egypt even that's uh, in, in a modern life. Uh, they always talking about Egypt, you know, that's in a historical background and our, uh, you know, that's a uh, uh, contribution and uh, in the, you know, that's uh, in the old civilization. But still up to now, they are not taking Egypt as, you know, uh, uh, a partner. Oh, okay. It's okay. Uh, still, you know, that's really they are looking at Egypt in, 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 uh, as a history. And, you know, this is, you know, the, the main uh, problem. And the, we are, as an embassy here, we are trying. Yes, we use our legacy. We use our, you know, that's a historic, you know, that's contribution. And uh, we are trying to, you know, the, use this credit to attract the people to go to Egypt as, you know, tourists, but also to discover Egypt in two ways, historically and also in, in, in modernity. And this is very, very important because I said really don't take Egypt as only as a history. It's still our partners. We can, you know, we are sharing, you know, that's uh, the same values, uh, you know, that's uh, in, in, in our life right now. We need to understand <coughs> more and more, you know, that's Egypt. N Egypt, not only history, because sometimes really we face a problem that you are, uh, we are stuck on our history. This is, you know, a very big problem, but maybe I'll give Ayman and I'll come back to you again uh, to brief us about, you know, this, uh, you know, agreement. And uh, let me ask some questions before Ayman, because I couldn't agree more. <coughs> I did not live at the time of the pharaohs, even of Cleopatra, but I did live in the Middle East some years ago. I was a regional lawyer for the government. I spent a lot of time in Cairo. I have a center in Cairo. And if you, <coughs> you cannot, sorry. I was speaking to the ambassador, but I suppose I should speak to all of us. <laughs> um, I was saying I did not live at the time of the pharaoh, even Cleopatra, but I have lived in the Middle East, and I spent a lot of time in Egypt. Uh, I'm a law professor, and we have a center in Cairo. Um, and if you go to Cairo, you realize there's a lot more to Egypt than the past. Uh, so pick two points. One, uh, that we tend to think of King Tut when we think of Egypt. That's a mistake. And secondly, maybe another dimension between security slash strategy and, on the other hand, culture, economics. But f the first point, um, I think you're right. Um, I don't know how one encourages students. I'm a professor at Georgetown. But I think that's <coughs> crucial. Um, and, I, and kids, by the way, will not be particularly intimidated by fear of terror and things of that sort. So I think if their funds are available, and both ways. Uh, I was just at a UN meeting in Vienna, sat behind three young Egyptians. Uh, first rate, they're solid, very Egyptian, very calm, very composed. Um, but Egyptians coming here and Americans and others, non-Egyptians going to Egypt would be crucial. Although I think you have to admit the past in this way. Uh, and I do some work with China. The Chinese are constantly telling us how long they've been on this earth. But my hunch is the Egyptians have been at least as long. And that's not irrelevant because I think what it brings home to students today that Egypt is a great civilization, and, and a complicated one. You know, I, I've been quite well educated in America, but I never, for example, knew really the position of Greeks in Egypt, for example, um, which also, I think, is not irrelevant to Westerners because um, it sort of tells you something. <coughs> um, and so I think that's, but, but let me go to the economics, because there's something between 
security, anti-terrorism strategy on one hand, and culture and archaeology, et cetera. And, and, and that's the economics. And, and here this is a, a sort of a question. Uh, when I was the lawyer in the United States, uh, I, I was both with the AID and the State Department, and of course we had a large economic relationship, and I think we always pressed very hard. The U.S. did press for change, gradual change, uh, which incidentally I thought was being actually before the quote, Arab Spring, I think, was taking place. And, and I suppose the question really is how can you, what should be the optimum, the best relationship between the United States and Egypt with respect to economic development, both with respect to private sector development, public sector support. Uh, I don't myself, I'm not that familiar with the thinking of the admi American administration, nor for that matter the thinking of the Egyptian administration. But it seems to me, ultimately, and I think you intimated this, uh, there will, no security will ever be sufficient if the people do not have a feeling that the society is developing in their interest. And for better or for worse in the modern age, that means material interest and economic. In the past, it might have been more spiritual, more cultural, but I think today it is material and economic. So I'd be curious if you could speak briefly about the relationship between Egypt on the one hand, the United States, maybe other Western countries in economic development, economic relations, not just trade, but just overall business relations, uh, cooperation on research, uh, maybe cooperation between universities who are interested in financial, economic, and technological development. Uh, that's here again, you know, that's a, you open a, a new, uh, you know, that's a dimension which uh, is very, very important and uh, unfortunately, uh, if you can, you know, evaluate the relationship be between Egypt and the United States, you know, in in uh, in economic, you know, that's a you know a dimension. If, uh, it's not, frankly speaking, it's not up to the expectation of the you know, our people, or you know, that's uh, the the two sides, you know, that's uh, you know, the, with all our capabilities, with all our you know, that's uh, uh, you know, that's. Uh, uh, our, uh, you know, that's what we, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, I think we have a lot of opportunity in Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, and we offer a lot of, you know, that's, uh, yeah, you know, that's uh, uh, a chance, you know, for you know, the American, you know, that's companies to, to come and to attract, you know, that's to come even through that's the new uh, investment flow. But doesn't mean really, I'm not talking about the law itself, but the, the, the main problem here sometimes really in the United States with all this narrative will be circulated here through that the media and think tanks and, and so on. This is, you know, the main uh, obstacle for all of us on our work. And the people, they are afraid to go to Egypt, either to, to visit or uh, even, as you said, ready to, to talk about the students, to go to Egypt because still we have a travel advisory and so on, which is uh, we're always trying uh, to, to reverse, you know, this uh, travel advisory. or. To, to go to for you know that's uh, to, to invest because they, they always uh, you know that's unfortunately motivated by you know that's a misperception about my country about you know that's uh, what's going on there because any uh, terrorist attack which it can happen here in uh, in uh, DC or it can happen in Paris or anywhere. Rome and anywhere but it will always be magnified, you know, that's, uh, and they have a lot of, you know, that's a uh, focus on what happened in Egypt, as if, you know, this on all Egypt. Mm -hmm. We are talking about even, we, we had, you know, I, we, when I mentioned about, you know, what happened in North Sinai, yes, it's, a, it's a, a really a very, very, very big one. We killed, you know, that's, a, that's 300, they killed, you know, 300, you know, more than 300 people. But again, in which area and so on, but here, they put it as if this is, you know, this all Egypt. We face, you know, this problem. Nobody really, as I said, really, uh, you know, that uh, we will be encouraged to go to Egypt or to be, you know, that uh, uh, to have an appetite, as I said, really, to invest or to to visit or, you know, to send, you know, that says children to to visit Egypt. But this is not the case, and this is what we are trying. And but unfortunately, as I said, the media coverage and so on. This is what we are facing right now. Yes. Let me just follow up, and then I'll be quiet for a bit. Um, there must be many Egyptian Americans, Egyptians who live here, who know Egypt well, who go back and forth, who have colleagues in Egypt, business partners, and family, etc. Are you able to exploit their presence? I mean, they are probably quite active in many cities in America. 
and who, who could might maybe rebut the media. I mean, I think serious people don't take the media seriously. I say that although I have three children, two of them are in the media, but, and I do take them seriously, but not what they do. Um, but I think serious people will not be misled by media accounts if they, you know, have relatives, business partners, colleagues in Egypt who come back and forth. And do you try to encourage sort of that kind of thing, you know, bringing Egyptians here, you know, and, 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 and just to sort of just reassure uh, their colleagues that uh, Egypt is, quote, open for business, you know. And, but I don't mean just private investment. I mean general economic cooperation and activity. No, we are trying now. We have now this, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Saleh, you know, that's, he is now, in, uh, you know, one of our, uh, you know, that's a uh, big name here, here that's an Egyptian. And, uh, you know, that's uh, here also reflecting, you know, that's uh, what you are talking about, you know, that's uh, for sure he's doing, you know, that's the maximum to promote his country and with the others. And, he, you know, this is, you know, what also one of our ways here, our tools, mm -hmm. we are trying, you know, that's uh, to utilize, uh, to use it, uh, frankly speaking. But they are doing even willingly and, uh, you know, voluntarily by themselves even without, you know, that's uh, any mm -hmm. approach fr from the embassy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but as I said, you know, that's uh, the, the main problem. Uh, we are, you know, that's, uh, I always said really, Egypt is not uh, Switzerland. We are living in, in, a, in a different neighborhood. That's our neighbors who, you know, that's uh, Libya. We are, uh, you know, that's uh, yeah, Gaza. Uh, you know, that's, I don't like, you know, to be named all, you know, that's, and you see that's what's going on in, in Syria and Iraq and so on. Everybody, you know, that's here thought that Egypt's like, you know, those countries. Nobody, you know, that's a ticket as if, you know, Egypt is stable and, and, you know, that's, that's, you can make business there or Egypt is ready to, uh, you know, attract, you know, that's your investment or attract, you know, that's uh, to be an, uh, you know, uh, as I said, really, uh, uh, or to be a safe, you know, that's a, 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 a for you know that's any uh, you know that's a, a tourist to, to go to Egypt, and this is the problem, our problem. But it's not a matter of you know that's my work or you know that's our uh, Egyptian community here, how they are, they, how they are uh, you know doing or what's their reaction and how they are, uh, you know that's. Uh, Maybe I will give maybe a while here. Maybe I would like to, to add something concerning uh, economic before also back again to Ayman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. If I can go back also to some of the topics that you touched on, if I go back to Israel. Thank you. Uh, I, I really want to touch upon several points here, but very, very quickly, I will not uh, give myself the right to take much of your time. But when it comes to history in, in specific, because I have seen that Dr. Uh, Wallace and as well as Dr. Alexander have paid great attention to this part, I like to look at history in a different context. I al we always say that Egypt is a country that has that is 7,000 years old. Oh, we, we, we all know that. We all know about the, the Muslims who were there, the cops who were there, the, the, the Romans who were there, the British who were there. I'm, I'm not going to go into that. But what I want to say here is if we remember, if, if, if we can imagine over the course of 7,000 years, how many droughts Egypt has gone through? How many waves of famines Egypt has gone through? How many waves of, of uh, 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 invasions Egypt has gone through? How many waves of uh, epidemics Egypt has gone through? Many. Yet, over the course of 7,000 years, Egypt has always persisted. Egypt has always come out of each and every one of these problems or, or crises as a strong nation. So the idea of the nationhood has always been there and is going to continue. So Egypt, it, it, the historical understanding of Egypt as a nation is very important for us to, to, to notice. This is one thing that is very important. The other thing is when it comes to the economy, and I'm, I'm going to let Mr. Uh, Dissoui elaborate on that much more. He's, he's much more acquainted with, with this world than I am. But what I always say is that Maybe the worst thing that we have in our relationship with the U.S., maybe Mr. Ambassador is not going to like what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it nevertheless and ask for his, uh, for his permission. Maybe the worst thing that we have is most of the time we are only focusing on the aspect of the relationship in terms of donor recipient. Okay? And my, my per perception of this is, uh, uh, personally, I hate very much to, to hear the word assistance. The I, word what? Assistance. I hate very much to hear the word aid, because to me, 
this is not assistance and it's not aid. What it is in, in reality is these are appropriations from American, from the American budget to advance American national interests in the region through Egypt. So they're not giving something out of benevolence or out of charity or anything. These are, this is money that is given out of American federal budget to advance American national interests in Egypt. This is one aspect of it. The second aspect is, unfortunately, until this very day, we do not see a big, huge project from the U.S. in Egypt. We have not seen uh, this so far. I'm, I'm not, I will not try to make you jealous here. I know how America, how American, how very proud Americans are and how very uh, uh, skeptics uh, Americans are when it comes to Russia, for example. But if we look at what Russia did for Egypt, I'm very sorry to say it, but I'll give you examples here. The high dam, Russia. The aluminum complex, Russia. Uh, uh, iron and steel, the mills, Russia. So far, what the U.S. is focusing on is consumer products. We need something big from the U.S. to be built in Egypt. This is something that is going to give visibility to, to the U.S. from the one side, and this is something that is going to prove the kind of strategic uh, partnership that we say that we have, but that, that until this very day w does not show to the people. It, it, it's running on, the, on, on, on government to government level, but not on the, uh, on, uh, on the people. Third point, when it comes to uh, uh, academic exchange, a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Ambassador remembers this, we had Ambassador uh, Frank Ricciardoni coming to the embassy uh, visiting the ambassador. And he said that he is very sad that only 18 American students are in the American University in Cairo now. It, in, the number in the past used to be 200, 300 um, uh, American students. Today, it's only 18, or maybe less than that. And the reason for this is that the American administration, the American, uh, the, the State Department in particular, have issued travel advisories on Egypt that are so negative that unfortunately give the wrong impression. If you read the travel advisories uh, issued by the State Department, you'll get the impression that Egypt is uh, in, in, in a very bad shape, that just like Mr. Ambassador mentioned, that the, the, the terrorist attack that happened a couple of weeks ago in, in northern Sinai is the norm in the valley throughout Egypt. That is, that is not the case. What is happening in Egypt is that we have a very small geographical er uh, area that is subject to terrorist uh, attacks. This area is not more than 2%, and, and mind you, not 2% of the uh, 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 overall uh, area of Egypt, it's only 2% of the area of Sinai. Hmm. <coughs> so I'm, I'm not here to trying to criticize the American administration or the State Department. This is not my intention at all. But what I mean here is that sometimes not naming things how, um, by the names that they, that they really are in reality gives the wrong impression and therefore are detrimental to the development of relations. So we count on our American partners to, to support Egypt. Egypt is at one time a country that is fighting terrorism, a country that is modernizing uh, uh, a religious discourse, a country that is going, uh, undergoing massive economic reform, and this is a country that should be supported. So we hope that the support that the American administration or the American people in general can give to Egypt uh, it should, be ref should, should reflect the value of Egypt, the meaning of Egypt in the region. This is not just any country. This is a major country in the region and should be supported much more than it is supported now. Thank you. May I add a, a footnote, a very quick footnote? Yeah, here is the, yeah. 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 May I add a footnote? Uh, my name is Salah Hassan. I'm a, a professor of business administration at the School of Business at George Washington University. Uh, first of all, I would like to very quickly uh, echo uh, thank you to uh, Professor Wallace for uh, 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 raising that point, and also thank you to Professor Alexander for organizing the panel. And definitely, I really appreciate the uh, comments uh, raised by His Excellency the Ambassador and the Dream Team in that respect. I would like to echo the point that is being raised here, uh, that really uh, we, we need to uh, change the perception of Egypt uh, from an aid recipient nation to a true partner. Uh, and I think this point is, you really stole the words from my mouth. Uh, this is exactly what uh, uh, have been crossing my mind for a long time. For how long are we going to be uh, stereotyped as recipient of aid? Um, I think we are strategically important to the U.S. Uh, as, must, as much as the U.S. is strategically important uh, to Egypt. And I think once we uh, deal with Egypt as a U.S. Uh, superpower. We deal with Egypt as a 
uh, great uh, 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 regional uh, uh, leader for transformation and for economic development. Uh, that's very important. Uh, I really echo your point in what are the mega projects that have we uh, done in Egypt. And I think the opportunity is a golden opportunity for us. I'm a proud Egyptian American, and I'm saying that out of passion uh, for my homeland and equal passion for uh, my uh, land of, uh, you know, uh, citizenship here, my new country here. And, and that is really education. No? Uh, uh, education uh, system in Egypt, and I think President Sisi recently have echoed that, uh, that is ready for a partnership. And I think we need to seize this opportunity. Yeah? Uh, our most important uh, export uh, service is really higher education from a U.S. Uh, point of view. We are the envy of the world uh, in this industry, higher education. And I think maybe this can be one of the resolutions uh, out of this panel, is how to move forward. Uh, and I really would like to recommend, uh, under the auspices of the Potomac Institute, uh, of having a group of American Egyptian uh, professors that share that passion for security and economic development and sustainability, but to have a subcommittee in looking after what, how can we help uh, Egypt uh, move forward with uh, educational uh, uh, transformation. No? Uh, not only in education, but also in healthcare, uh, in government services. Uh, the, the country is building uh, a, a new administrative uh, capital uh, right, uh, you know, out of the current capital, and that requires a major management training, management development, the higher education sector, the healthcare sector. Here are three pillars that we are really known globally as being best practice in higher education, healthcare, and uh, government, and e-government, and so forth. Why can't we uh, really make a major initiative from the U.S. side, uh, not to not to help Egypt, but to partner with Egypt. Huh? Because when we, st when we send students, and I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that uh, President Richard Doney uh, is reported on diminishing number of American students, and I have faced that. I, I, I used to lead a, 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 a university partnership program uh, fully funded by the Fulbright Commission uh, for nearly five years, uh, and it was unbelievable experience. Well, no, well, actually, with. Alexandria University because Fulbright wanted to partner with a public institution and they told me any public institution in Egypt that is out of Cairo mm -hmm. uh, and that was Alexandria that was my choice and we built the first executive MBA program in the region that is an international partnership program and that was between George Washington University and the uh, Faculty of Commerce in Alexandria University and I tell you we benefited as much from it as they did uh, um, you know, because the faculty that went from here to Egypt, they were the fir for the first time there uh, to visit Egypt. As a matter of fact, they didn't know what to expect. And the overwhelming feedback yeah. that I got from my colleagues is, wow, I didn't know that Egypt is so modern. No? Um, so that's my footnote. So, yeah. Uh, again, I'm yeah. I want to say something for this. Uh, you know, first of all, I'm saddened that that you believe that America has, and, it, and you may be right, this perception of Egypt, because I've been involved for years, uh, not in a central way, but quite a lot with the Middle East, and I've never had such a perception of Egypt, number one. I've always thought it's very high, really. Secondly, I agree with you completely, and, but I don't think of Egypt as a sister and a sister. I think of it as a partnership. And in that respect, the 7,000 years are relevant, not to mention the temperament that it's created in the Egyptian people. I mean, I spent enough time in Egypt to know the, and I mentioned it when I was at the, about the UN meeting, I was in Vienna last week, Egyptians have a philosophic, I don't mean it in a sort of passive way, they are calm, something Americans could learn something about. But I, two specific things. One, actually I'm in correspondence by coincidence with Frank Riccioni right now, and uh, suggested by a friend of mine, um, and I do think AUC is relevant. I mean, most Americans don't realize anymore that we have American, quote, universities in the, in the Middle East. I mean, that's how ignorant we've become. Uh, so I think AUC is relevant, and, and, you sh and he should be encouraged to think big, and not just to help himself, but to help other universities. Um, I once got a medal from the University of Cairo, so I have regard for it. 
Uh, and the second thing is, I'm, I'm a Republican. I have to confess I'm not a Trumpian Republican. But uh, whatever you say about President Trump, he likes to think big. Um, it seems to me that the point you made before, of course, the high dam is another story. We once did support it. I've been reading books about John Foster Dulles and Ike. So, mm. um, But the idea of a big project would appeal to him. And I think the next time President El Sisi comes here, he shouldn't just come to talk about Yona knows that I'm always a skeptic about this Yona's great specialty in anti-terror. I mean, of course it's crucial and we don't want to be the victim of it, but it's really a symptom of much deeper things and broader things. And it seems to me the next time the president comes here, uh, General El Sisi, he should talk about that, an Aswan Dam, the equivalent. I don't know what it would be today. Maybe it's the, the Western Desert, who the hell knows. Um, but you know, there's some, Egypt is big, and I don't agree with you. I think Americans have a higher opinion of Egypt. It's not just one more country in the Middle East or in the Maghreb. Egypt is a great country. I'm not saying it has done all the great things that Dan will ought to do. That's another story. It is a great country. It's a great civilization. It's large. It's always been the intellectual and cultural center of that part of the world. I've never thought of Saudi Arabia as being that. Um, I think Iran is another great country, and that's an interesting kind of tension because here are two great civilizations. And, and, and I think it's relevant. Americans are not that dumb. I mean, we appreciate to some extent, if only subliminally, the relevance of the past. I mentioned China before. So I, I think Egypt has a, a – and I'm not just saying this because I want to be polite to the ambassador. I'm trying to think of ways to be impolite. But I do think – you know, just like his team. No. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're trying. They, cannot, they can't do it. But no, I really mean it. I don't think you should sell yourself short for one single minute. But I can understand the struggle you're talking about. But you've got to ignore the bad and emphasize the good, you know? My feeling. Yeah. OK. I, I think, uh, you know, <coughs> but Mr. Ambassador, you want to respond to that? Uh, okay, maybe yeah, we, uh, have, I mean, we, we have still we have uh, Ayman we because uh, yes, uh, because uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, maybe just uh, only one observation here because you mentioned about you know that uh, President Sisi as a general, uh, which is really I would like to emphasize, he's a president now, not anymore a general. But I called him both. I called yes, him president. <laughs> <laughs> and this is very uh, important. But uh, <coughs> again, I don't like as I said really. I will leave you know that's a please you know that's a continue and uh, then I will have my observation later. Please. Okay. Okay, no, sure. Yes. No, no. The uh, obviously we we can go in different uh, directions, but uh, the key <coughs> is uh, at least in my humble opinion is um, what can we learn from the lessons of the past? Uh, let's say the forty years or before that, uh, speaking about the the dam, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, here is a case in point which is very critical to preserve the antiquities of Egypt. Um, going all the way back so people would understand the history, where it's coming from, where it's going, and all that. So this is one, one case in point, and maybe you can just elaborate a little bit on that. We, we need the mic here. Mic, yes. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Professor Yuna. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. When it comes to countering terrorism, is is really very linked to uh, other factors, especially economic, social, uh, sometimes political, and also the cultural factor is extremely important for many reasons. Uh, one of them is it's really linked to the uh, distorted message the uh, terrorists are using to recruit more foreign fighters around the world. And this is really crucial. And Egypt is playing uh, a critical role in, in this fight. Uh, we have uh, uh, what we can call the most appealing and moderate Islamic institution in the Islamic world, the Al Azhar institutions. And we have uh, Dar al Ifta. And if you look what they did over the last few years, you will see how much actually we achieve in this uh, field. So we have the. Uh, Dar al Ifta, for example, uh, has taken the lead uh, in establishing the general secretariat uh, for the uh, fatwa authorities around the world. And they are engaged right now to uh, answer and reply to any distorted or misinterpreted uh, fatwa comes from any terrorist or extremism uh, around the world. The second thing is the uh, Al Azhar institution. I'm just giving one example, but there are many of that. They have something called uh, the online observatory. 
this online observatory it it's really monitor and report and reply to the uh, distorted messages the terrorist group are promoting around the world and it's really uh, achieved lots of success not only in Egypt but around the world and if you look to the statistics regarding the foreign fighters in Iraq and Syria uh, actually published by the Washington Post maybe a few months ago you will figure out only uh, 336 foreign fighters in both countries coming from Egypt while in, from Tunisia 7,300 something yeah. and if we made the math between the two population of the two countries, I think it's it gonna be a disaster if we have the same percentage of the Tunisian foreign fighters. Uh, that's one of the aspects. When it comes to cultural, uh, I highly appreciate really the US support and, and this field. It took us maybe like more than four years until the ambassador came and we managed to sign the MOU last uh, December uh, in Washington DC. And this MOU is extremely important for many reasons. Once, because it's going to help us or actually uh, uh, transfer the burden of proof about looted antiquities inside the U.S. or uh, showed in any exhibition here in the U.S. Uh, to the U.S. authorities. Uh, in the past, if, when we ask for repatriation of any antiquities, they ask us, you have to prove that it was looted out of Egypt improperly or illicitly. And Nowadays, after this MOU, this burden have been transferred to the U.S. side, and this really will help us a lot. The second issue is, uh, according to this MOU, the U.S. is going to uh, help us in uh, uh, making the uh, register of the Egyptian antiquities. And it's extremely important. Once you have this register, you can monitor in a better way. Our guarding will be more effective, and especially we having the uh, new Grand Museum, uh, we are planning to open it in 2018. It's going to be, it's a grand, it's going to be uh, the largest museum in the world. It's going to be inaugurated in the summer of 2018, and it's going to be very close to the permits. So the this issue is really uh, important for us. Uh, another link between culture and uh, terrorism and the U.S. role, uh, we uh, have uh, a very uh, good experience with some uh, U.S. Uh, NGOs and think tanks, the Middle East Institute in Washington, and also the International Coalition uh, to Protect Egyptian Antiquities. We hosted in 2015 as a leading role in the uh, region, the first uh, conference uh, trying to elaborate on the role of uh, the antiquities and how the terrorist groups used the antiquities as a source of finance for their uh, terrorist act. And we came out with the, what we call Cairo Declaration with some recommendations, mainly focusing on uh, creating more mechanisms to uh, promote the real uh, message, how we need to protect antiquities, not only in Egypt, but also in Iraq, in, uh, in Syria, in Libya, in Morocco, and Algeria. Uh, and this uh, conference w was attended by seven ministers and more than uh, maybe 50 experts from around the world. And we're still working to have another one maybe next year in, in Cairo again. So uh, the role of Egypt in, and the U.S. is really crucial. Uh, uh, U.S. is a, a demand country, uh, while Egypt is really the country suffering from looting their antiquities and other uh, regionals. Uh, protecting antiquities is not only protecting artifacts. No, they are protecting culture, heritage, and history of the country. And when it comes to history, when we see the Egyptian history, it's not Egyptian history. It's the world history. Yes, maybe actually we have the privilege to have the antiquities in our land, but it's human heritage, and everybody in the world, including the U.S., are responsible for protecting this uh, antiquities. And if I may, just in one word, uh, completing what my colleague and the ambassador said regarding economy, uh, uh, we highly appreciate the U.S. support over the last 40 years. It really uh, helped us to upgrade our infrastructure, improve the health situation in Egypt, even provide us with more assistance in the education field. However, there are many issues uh, can be done. It's not going to cost the U.S. a lot, but it's going to send the right message to the region, to the Egyptian people, and also it's going to help the Egyptian economy. Just like the loan guarantees, and we need the support of the U.S. to in uh, this uh, matter. And the other issue is the debt swabbing, the offsetting debts, all these issues not going to cost the U.S. administration a lot or the U.S. taxpayer a lot. 
but it's gonna mean a lot for the Egyptian economy and for the Egyptian people and send the right message that the US is still there our strategic uh, relation is really uh, heading in the right direction thank you sir okay I, again you know that's I think uh, as I said really my uh, dream team already brief you what uh, what's going on in uh, my uh, country but uh, I would like to add here it's very important concerning what we are facing right now if we are linking you know, all that's uh, economically and the security culturally and and so on uh, I think why maybe he mentioned but he not really elaborate about you know uh, what's going on which is uh, countering uh, you know messaging or we can say that uh, the announcement of President Sisi three years ago concerning uh, religion uh, you know that he asked her to have a reform for religion discourse I think this is the most important step taken by an Egyptian leader and you know that's uh, uh, and also uh, Egypt as you know that's uh, a, a Muslim you know that's the biggest Muslim country uh, in the Arab world this is very very important uh, unfortunately in the beginning yes uh, a lot of you know people talking about you know this initiative from the president Sisi but nobody really focused about you know this is how much they don't give away uh, for this initiative I I put it like this this initiative it is like it's like the visit of President uh, Sadat to Jerusalem <coughs> when uh, President Sadat 40 years ago he visited uh, Jerusalem and he changed the the face of uh, the region again three years ago when the uh, President Sisi you know that's uh, uh, declared you know this initiative it is, as I said, I put it in equal foot with the, pre the visit of President Sadat to Jerusalem. It is very crucial, very important. Why I put it like this? Because always Egypt sets the tone in the region. You will see <coughs> what's going on after, you know, that a lot of countries in the region will follow this tone, will follow, you know, that's the same, you know, that's the path, which we will try <coughs> to reform, you know, that's the religion discourse. This is the, the main issue because up to now, unfortunately, the whole strategy to counter, you know, terrorism, they are talking about counter terrorists. Nobody really talking about counter terrorism. Whatever you are talking about now that you're dealing with ISIS and uh, mm -hmm. dealing with, you know, that's a Boko Haram or Shabab or whatsoever, uh, or a Muslim Brotherhood and so on, still you are dealing with uh, only terrorists. But the core issue here, uh, ideology. Nobody really touches ideology. But the President Sisi, he touched it, <coughs> and he said clearly, and he pen a point, you know, that's exactly what is the, the, uh, the you know, that's uh, the, the core issue. It is ideology. We should face it. We should, you know, tackle with this issue. And he said clearly, okay, let's start by ourselves. We will not need even, you know, that's lecture from outside and so on. We'll start with ourselves. Let's, you know, to see that uh, we have an illness. <coughs> and we we will start to uh, you know that's uh, uh, as a protocol you know that's uh, to uh, for you know that's uh, to to be that's uh, you know that's uh, to, to start to re to re uh, rectify our past and so on and we're already in the process this is in the process we we now we're in the process of uh, trying uh, to clear all the cr our curriculum and so on we are trying you know this an interagency uh, a process in, in Egypt trying really that's uh, to reach it to uh, to achieve this goal I think we put it as a time frame I think 2021 uh, uh, to, to finish all the curriculum and so this is really a, a, a great job a great job it should be focused here you know it's interesting as I listen to the ambassador and to and also to the the others uh, it's very clear to me that but as it seems to me that <coughs> Egypt is taking some very important steps couldn't agree with you more about uh, ideology, and I think it's very important that the largest <coughs> country in the Middle East, a Muslim country with a Christian minority, is grappling with this very issue. Al Hazar, of course, is historic. The observatory, the online observatory, is interesting. <coughs> it seems to me that Egypt's doing a great deal, and we don't know about it. And so there's a double issue. One, of course, is the negative, you know, the report of the negative. And I did read, I think you wrote the letter saying it's yes. rather unfortunate the way you <laughs> reported. It was our fault that, you know, the, this massacre took place. But, you know, the media is what it is. But I think, 
I, there was a song once in America, Accentuate the Positive, eliminate, <coughs> eliminate the Negative. That was the song, Accentuate the Positive, <coughs> Eliminate the Negative. I mean, it seems to me the negative is there, and it's going to be there whether we like it or not. But accentuating the positive is to me the, it seems to me you just have to somehow tell the story of modern Egypt more strongly. Now, I had a friend who, <coughs> Fred Dutton, years <coughs> ago, he um, sort of, ad he, he was the uh, sort of American advisor for the Saudis. And so he did quite a good job for Saudi Arabia, which of course, I mean, Egypt is large, understood by many Americans, is not thought to be an obscure nation living in the desert the way the Saudis have been thought, and he sort of tried to bring out publicity. But Egypt has an infinitely better story to tell. And it seems to me, and it's, this is an issue. I lived in Turkey years ago, and I remember <coughs> talking to the Turks, never were very good at public relations. They were rather inner directed, rather polite. I have an English wife, polite. Egyptians are polite. Uh, you do, I, you, I, I, I don't want you to hire a public relations person. That's because you have people in the embassy. But that's the, it seems to me that's the issue, that you're not so, the story of modern Egypt is not being told properly. And, That's and, an excellent you know, point. I mean, see, you know, and, this is and, right in the heart of my field, nation branding. Well, yeah, and look at, and look at the things you've described. They're utterly impressive. Right. Hey, the online <laughs> observatory, <laughs> rebutting fatwa, I mean, good. And then it's all there, and it seems to me, and maybe, I mean, it's, it's sort of be rather interesting for the ambassador to pull together all this tremendous expertise which exists here. And it's not exploitative. It's not even condescending. It's not. It's none of that. It's not the old shenanigans about you know, we want to exploit the e Egyptian economy. No, no. It's very clear. It's in our, as you said, it's in our American interest that Americans and others fully understand Egypt. And of course, it's very hard to overcome some of the. I'm a professor, but as are you, some would ov to overcome American. I mean, Americans are intelligent. They're energetic. They're competitive, and I would say they're badly educated. That's all there's to it. It may not be unique in that respect, but on the other hand, we have unique power. I wouldn't say our president's the most educated man, to put it in a very mild fashion. So you just have to live with that. But it seems to me, you just, uh, and you have to be an optimist. Uh, the Americans are still a, an optimistic, bouncy country, a lot of moxie. Just have to keep on telling this story. And you've got to exploit your friends and, and others. I mean, I've had a dealings in the past looking for, I had a friend, Ali Shalakani, you may have remembered him. Yeah. And Mona's my friend, and et cetera, and so forth. And I mean, this was an issue that came up with him with some project he has. And we looked for some rich Egyptian who sold blueberries in Maine or something like that. Do you remember there was a, it used to be a, a, some Scotsman and there became an Egyptian. He was Mr. Blueberry. Well, they exist. We know that. They exist all over the country. These very successful Egyptians. You just got to find out one, you know, they just have to do it. It's their duty. And the Israelis are good at that. I mean, look at how many uh, Americans of sort of serve Israel and the United States at the same time. Yeah. At, a, at a minimum, the Egyptians should be able to do the same. And you have a much, in my view, bigger story to tell. Yeah. My own the, uh, if, if I may, uh, <coughs> Mr. Ambassador, come back <coughs> to your very important point <coughs> about how to combat radicalization and how to diffuse the negative elements from uh, religion to understand what Islam is uh, all about um, and um, to, to find the positive aspects, for example, in the Quran, if I, I quote uh, one, one of the sayings, if you want peace, give them peace and trust in God, um, and so forth. So I think Egypt um, is trying to contribute also not only in terms of intelligence and security issues, and exercises and so on and so forth, but uh, also to uh, teach the clergy uh, about the issues that are really critical um, to advance the cause of peace with uh, justice, to bring in the clergy, to teach them to collaborate uh, with uh, countries uh, such as uh, Morocco and others who are doing s similar things in this area. So number one, vis-a-vis -vis Islam. Number two, on the ecumenical level, to work with other religions and see how can religion advance the cause of peace. So there are very specific steps and Egypt is doing it. The problem again is not very well known Another very important issue 
that I think <coughs> deserves much greater attention is the role of Egypt to host refugees, for example, from Syria and Libya and elsewhere, that they need the support from the United States and other, and other nations. It's not very well known. So again, it's not a question of the PR. You, you, you don't invent something that doesn't exist. And uh, it's, it seems to me, again, to uh, mobilize uh, Egyptian Americans uh, as well as um, friends of Egypt to do what uh, can be done in a very practical way. So one, one would be a communication, of course. But as academics, I, I want again to mention that uh, many of our students who went to Egypt to study uh, Arabic and culture came back as ambassadors of Egypt mm -hmm. to the United States and many other countries. We have seen that, and I think this should be encouraged and maybe to establish some sort of a fund. I wouldn't call it a Marshall Fund, but to be able to encourage students to study Arabic and uh, Arab civilization uh, in Egypt and to be able to do so because sometimes it's uh, the financial you know, aspect. So there are small steps, but these small steps are very, very significant. No, it's very, very important, if you allow me, and uh, that's, uh, first of all, uh, maybe just to have one reservation here to allow me. Uh, we don't have, you know, this kind of minority, if, because, again, uh, as an Egyptian, we are, uh, you know, that's our citizen. We have, you know, that we believe in citizenship. This is, again, the present CC is emphasized. We would like to build the nation based on the citizenship, mm -hmm. uh, regardless what's your belief. Exactly. And this is very important for to, uh, to you know this is this is a kind of our reforms. It's very important to respect the others and to understand you know it's not necessarily even that you are you know, your religion that you are, you are you know the Christian or Jew or a Muslim or a non-believer. This it doesn't matter. You are Egyptian, and this is very important. You are sharing you know this you know that's uh, uh, this nation. You have your rights and you have your responsibilities, regardless of your gender or your religion. This is very, very important. That means, f to be sure, we don't have a majority or minority. This is very clear, even if you go to ask any Christian here, an Egyptian, uh, you know, that's uh, American, you are a minority, and uh, you know, that's, he will never claim him, himself that they are a minority. They refuse to be, they all said, I'm Egyptian. If you go to, to Egypt, and you know that's your, the region, to ask anybody in the street, you are a Muslim or Christian, immediately his response will be, I'm Egyptian. Because this is what our feelings, what this our trying to build our nation. Because to, to have a distinction, this will be a very problematic. And this, I think this is a matter of our reforms, when we are building our nation to based on our citizenship. This is uh, first. Uh, second, you know, that's uh, concerning your students and they went to, to Egypt and so on, and this, uh, uh, all ambassadors, really, I would like to invite them, uh, you know, for one event in our embassy, to sit together uh, with also our, uh, you know, that uh, dream team, with all, you know, that's an Egyptian-American, to sit together, you know, that's to have, you know, that's a brainstorming, how we can, you know, that uh, circulate our, these all success stories about, uh, you know, Egypt. Uh, because I said, really, f to be very frank, we had problems, or we have, not we had, we have problems here with think tanks, with media. As I said, you mentioned about, you know, my letter. You know why we use, you know, this uh, channel, this, uh, you know, letter to editor? Because we always refused to publish any, you know, article from myself. <laughs> For this reason, we insist, yes. We insist really to send, you know, letters to editor to, to be published. Yeah. At least to have something ready to be published. But yeah. as I said, they refused. Uh, well, it, uh, they tell them. Yes, I, I just have a very small, a minor comment when it comes to publishing, when it comes to getting the positive message across. Uh, Professor Wallace, uh, who should be more acquainted with the realities in Egypt than American diplomats and the American embassy in Cairo? Who should be more acquainted with the success stories of Egypt than this 
than these than the, than the people who are being paid by taxpayers money in in the American in, in the American embassy in Cairo. Yet at the same time, we find that the travel advisory it reflects something completely entirely different than the situation on the ground. This is one point. The other point is, let me ask you a question here. Do you think that all the success stories, all the, the, the initiatives that, that Mr. Dessoui here mentioned, do you think that these are invisible while minor uh, uh, violations of human rights or minor incidents of terrorism are so visible? It's not the case. It's simply that the media sometimes, and specifically here in the US, is very selective. It's very, select, it's very selective. It leads if it bleeds. Okay, If it's something negative, we will focus on it. And the norm of the day, unfortunately, has become that if, you, if, if any country, specifically Egypt, I'm talking about my country now, if Egypt is taking two steps forward, we can forget about that. But if it's taking one step back, we should focus on that. This has become a systematic problem. And they always forget that taking two steps forward and one step back is still making progress. But they pick the negative stories and they forget the positive ones. We and the embassy, we do everything that we can. We spread the positive news. We say that we're doing this, we're doing that. We have fact sheets that we distribute everywhere uh, here in DC and across the US. But unfortunately, we don't have a printing house. We are not this or that newspaper. We are not that widespread as a, 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 a newspaper that has so much capital behind it and it's moving it. Sometimes they are politically driven. Sometimes they just pick the things that are going to create a, a, a public stir. Well, okay. You said well, if it Thank bleeds, you. it bleeds, but that's the reality, and you just have to. I mean, you have to, have to accept Thank you. it. I mean, I, I, my daughter ran NBC News, and I know how her mind works. And yeah. it's a very clever girl, but she's not going to solve your problem. But you know, first, of course, I think it's awfully healthy that Egyptians are Egyptians and Egyptians, and I I use the word minority only because. That's, no, what no, that's what right. Americans yes. use, but you're quite right. And I never ask anyone what their religion is or this or that, and I have been to Egypt a lot, and I just talk to people. Um, back to Yona, and then something you said, and then back here. Um, in the past, at least, both the Department of Education and the Department of Defense financed Americans going to study Arabic. And they went both to Cairo and Damascus. Well, I ain't going to Damascus anymore, so they're going to go to Cairo. So hopefully that could be built up a lot. Secondly, I don't know whether you have a Peace Corps. Do we have a Peace Corps anymore? Probably not, but the Peace Corps was a great thing in the past. Now, whether mothers will send their children to Egypt, you know, because of what you call the negative, you know, perceptions, but the Peace Corps is a tremendous way to get, uh, you know, you know the Peace Corps? It no, shows, I don't know. This well, then I can see, long. you see, I'm, Yona and I have been around for a long time. Yeah. You know, uh, as boys, we look forward to the World War I coming later, but, um, uh, the Peace Corps is a great American institution set up by, was run initially by John Kennedy's brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, and, and he justified the Peace Corps as partly, you know, the, I remember I, I used to work on this stuff and you'd go to Peru and there'd be some young American kid who helped him dig wells, you know, it was useful, yeah. but the real advantage, said Shriver, was when they came back, Americans learned about Peru. So the Peace Corps, if it could be done, different countries have the similar, but that, that could be revived. And uh, it was a real uh, useful American, and I think it still exists. It was a useful American institution, and the Amer young Americans like it, and they would go out and live in villages and things like that, you know, and, it, and, and they'd come back, and they'd probably study Arabic along the way, and, and s many of them went off and did other things. But going back to, you know, your final point, I, I just, you know, uh, it's easy to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. You just, one has to accept the world as it is, and that's the problem, and the challenge is, to craft the solution. So you have to cope with this media negativism, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. It's commercially motivated <laughs> in part. Just read a little book about uh, by a young woman called Katie Tour who covered the Trump campaign. And you read the book, and in some ways it's infuriating because she didn't particularly like President Trump, but she, you get carried along and you provide the publicity, and, and it's well, and you're competing and others, and you've got to get there with the scoop first so someone else doesn't do it. That is the reality. It's it cannot be. It's sort of like an it's an illness that will not go away. So you have to just figure out how to stand on top of it, and you just got to do it. And, and and Egyptians have the temperament, unlike a lot of other people who panic. My experience with Egyptians is you don't panic. We, we don't. don't. We don't panic. You know? well, you, in, fact, in fact, the danger is that you don't not. You know, yeah, I get the idea. We have to learn too many things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's a great quality. Yeah. 
No, that's uh, you look at things calmly, clearly, and then you just. But you uh, when you're talking about, you know, that's a PR and so on. For this reason, why we are here? We are here because of it. this is our uh, again, you know, that's uh, we would like, you know, that's our message. Yeah. Uh, to be spread. Yeah, PR is a terrible uh, word. I understand, but it's to but, tell the story. But again, this to tell the story. You know, yeah. that's a, to tell the truth. What yeah, we are truth. saying right now, yeah. this, this is the truth. Yeah. I ask you know anybody here in the in the room to go to Egypt and to check if we are, we are lying, to come back to me. I don't think you are. Why? No, okay. no, I'm saying really. I am challenging anybody here that's yeah. to go to Egypt. And Rafael, you know, that's is coming from Egypt. You know, that's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, and then in the interest of yeah. time, if I may ask uh, the audience, uh, I have one or two questions. Could okay. you, is, do okay. you have another few minutes? Mm, yes, a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Please. Salam alaikum, Ambassador. My name is Hassan. I was born in Tehran. And for uh, many years, I have lived in America since 1960. And I have come to realization that the uh, people who live in that Traveled, so called traveled area can do more for themselves than anybody else can come there and do for them. So don't look outwards, look inwards. Egypt, a large country with lots of resources. Turkey, another country, large country with lots of resources. Iran, large country with lots of resources. If in future is possible, for Egypt, Turkey, and Iran, make an alliance together. You represent Arabs. Turkey represents Turks. Iran presents Persians. Three different uh, so kind of uh, areas, but they're all common because they're all Muslims. And all of them have resources, human resources, natural resources, all kinds of resources and abilities and they have educated uh, personalities, I mean persons, populations. So Egypt is not uh, poor in education, neither is Turkey, neither is Iran. So stop looking to America, try to help you or try to help Iran or Turkey because America right now cannot even help itself because of the president that we have right now. So. In, in, so, in short, I think the people who live in Egypt feel kinship with people who live in Turkey. And they feel kinship with people who live in Iran. I don't think that that kind of kinship exists for America because in the past, things that has happened, America always is looking for their own interest. Sometimes that interest may line in line with the country's interest, sometime may not. So we need to know what Egyptian interest is for the Egypt, Turkish interest is for Turkey, Iran interest is for Iranian. Turkey for many, many years has tried to join the European Union. They've done all kinds of stuff. So they've come to a realization, since they're Muslims, there is no room for you in Europe. Same with Egypt, same with Iran. So my question is this, do you think one day such a dream as you have a dream team in here, is it possible for this dream to come true that you form an alliance with your brothers and sisters and then pull yourselves up all together from what you know ails you? You know, this is always a dream. You know, that's, uh, you know, and uh, as, 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 as long as I don't have, you know, that's uh, a crystal ball, I don't know exactly, but let's, you know, that's uh, always, you know, we should have always dreams. And we should be, you know, that's uh, uh, dreamers. Yes. And yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. One, one more uh, question there. And it's 3.30, you know. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Ira Strauss. I, if I may preface my question with an apology. Countries cannot apologize and shouldn't usually, uh, but private citizens can, and the Egyptian military viewed America as having foisted the Muslim Brotherhood on Egypt. It was exaggerated. It wasn't primarily America's fault, certainly not. 
But there was some truth to that accusation, and I think an apology is due. Egypt suffered the consequences, primarily done by Egyptians to themselves, but you're still cleaning up some of the consequences in Sinai and elsewhere, and I feel sorry for it, so I'd like to say that. Um, my question sort of follows from that. The American government is no longer following that policy. That's clear under this administration. But the previous administration didn't support El Sisi in his speech at Al Azhar. Maybe we are supporting you now on those matters. In Libya, there is a question of strategic partnership. Egypt has chosen a side. The United States is formally not choosing sides, but tends to lean toward the other side, if anything. Are we on the wrong side? Should we be choosing a side in the same side as Egypt? And are we losing influence to Russia in Egypt and elsewhere because Russia is sort of instinctively choosing the common sense anti-terrorist side, anti-Islamist side, and the United States is not. Could we be doing something differently that would make for a better strategic partnership with Egypt and Libya and maybe some other places? Uh, frankly speaking, you know, that's a, I don't see any uh, uh, a strategy or a policy vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, um, an American you know, strategy vis-a-vis Libya. If you know that's uh, last month really announced your strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran, it was now clear. But vis-a-vis uh, -vis Libya, we don't see it yet any uh, a clear cut policy how to deal with Libya and how really that's uh, what's the, the next. Uh, how you know the situation? El Siraj he was here. I don't have really a readout of the, his meetings, but still uh, you know that's we try to figure out exactly what's your policy as an American. Uh, because to answer you, your question, really, I should know exactly what's in their mind. Still, they are trying to figure out, you know, that's uh, with us, uh, what's exactly the situation on the ground. Because uh, Libya, it is um, the most important, you know, that's issue uh, for us. It's, uh, this is our, you know, that's a neighboring country. We, we have, you know, a lot of, you know, problems as in Sinai and so on, you know, that's a part of them because there are a lot of, you know, that's trafficking, you know, that's in, in, uh, in weapons and even in, in human trafficking and so on coming from uh, Libya and, you know, that's going to, to Sinai and so on. This means really we have a main threat now is coming from in, uh, the instability situation in Libya. For this reason, I said really the top priority for, for right now for us is Libya. We are trying to get, you know, the United States to be on, on board with us. But still, the United States is not yet in, on, in, in, uh, in any uh, side. To be very frank, maybe Barakat, if you have a different you know, point of view, because, uh, you know, but uh, for this reason, really, still, you know, United States, yes, maybe you have a policy, uh, you know, that's uh, on uh, Syria, uh, in Iraq, uh, in ISIS, and so on. But Libya, we, we don't see. And we always said, really, be careful because any vacuum, it should be filled. Any vacuum, it should be filled. And that's this is what can I say? Okay, I think uh, you know you were very gracious uh, with your time. Unfortunately, we would have to end the discussion, but uh, obviously, it's not the end of our dialogue. It's only the beginning, and we would like to express our appreciation again to you and your colleagues from the embassy for contributing to our discussion. Thank you very, Thank very much. much. Thank you. Thank you very much.